of the talk. Okay, thank you. The recording is in progress. I need to take this away. Okay. So I, I'm not coming from Malta, but I live in Malta, which is a small island in the Mediterranean. You see a little circle around it. And that island is kind of interesting because we have one of the few research institutes dedicated to game studies, especially video game studies. I'm an associate professor there. Um, I'm a visiting professor in the Laguna College of Art and Design in California. And I'm also a visiting researcher in Kyoto, Japan at the Ritsumeiken University. As Michael already mentioned, I have a background in philosophy and I use that background mostly to make games like this one. Uh, the games tend to have a philosophical theme or try to explain a philosophical point and they are normally financed by the European Union or other funds, meaning that they're short, they're free, so that you can use it in class or, um, I don't know, at events, for example. You can play this one for free, for example, doors.goatleni.com. You might have encountered this other one in the past years. It's a game about soup and analytical definitions, and you can play it at the address that you can see here. So, as a philosopher, I do not only do games, however, I also do public speeches like today's and uh, write books and texts of different kinds. Um, those are my first two books. And as you can tell by the title, they're kind of a weird mixture between philosophy and virtual worlds research and game studies. This kind of duality between philosophy and something else, in particular games, is kind of unique. And that's also what landed me a job, I guess. So what I do is I use my philosophical background to look into games and I use games to, in a way, redigest or repurpose some old philosophical questions and maybe, just maybe, um, give rise to new questions that would not be possible without, again, interactive fiction as a medium. I know that some of the uh, some of the organizers of this conference uh, read this article of mine, which is what made them decide to um, to invite me over. So, in case you're interested about this duality that I was talking about between philosophy and games, and what's the what's the let's say the intersection there, and what's interesting going on at the uh, on the surface of these two disciplines is um, you can you can check out this uh, article here. It's short, it's sweet, it's part of an encyclopedia, so anyone can read it. It's very good for undergrad students, I think. But let's get started. So I told you two books to begin with and a third one coming out on the topic of fictional games, which is what inspired and provided some of the material for this talk today. So without further ado, on fictional games. As I explained, I mostly publish in game studies with a philosophical angle. And since I imagine not many of you would know uh, at this point, being mostly philosophy students, what game studies are, I allowed myself a small introduction to the field. So game studies is a field of research that largely focuses on playable artifacts and playful activities. Um, we talk and think and write about a number of those activities that might be free and loose and require, let's say, the physical use of our bodies, like for example, in play or sports, um, some of those activities require a optimization and a quantification of performance, like for example, sports, as I already mentioned, or board games, card games, tabletop games. As you can also see by these two initial pictures, some of the things that we study require specific equipment, and uh, requires specific actions in order to, for an action or for a play, so to speak, to be considered successful. Some others do not have equipment. And um, uh, for example, I don't know, again, tag or hide and seek and so on and so forth. Uh, some of those playful activities are also translated within virtual worlds and we study video games in that sense and what it means to play and be in digital worlds meant to be played in. And well, again, I don't want to make this too long, but I hope you understand that when we talk about play and games, there's a wide variety of things, artifacts, activities, uh, modes of knowledge that are involved in what we study. So how do we make sense to this kind of fragmentation and complexity and variety? Well, 
one of the things that game studies focuses on, and maybe the only thing that what we study have in common, is the playability of that thing, is the playability of that activity. So is the playfulness of the activity. This thing in common is something that is, for example, recorded in some of the literature on the matter. For example, we read in Consalvo 2009 that, and I quote, games are created through acts of gameplay, which is contingent on player acts. Or Kalea, for example, mentions that a game becomes a game only when it's played, and until then it is a set of rules and game props awaiting human engagement. So the idea of playability, I uh, want to emphasize, is very much at the core of how we define our field of interest. However, I mentioned that it largely focuses on play uh, playable artifacts and playful activities. There are indeed some things that we look at in game studies and write about and think about that are not, or maybe no longer, playable. You can think, for example, about games that are unearthed in our archaeological um, digs, for example. In many cases, we manage to figure out how to play them. In other cases, we don't know. I mean, we know it's, it's a game because we, wrote, we, we read about it or we figured out that that's the kind of activity that was supposed to be hosted on that board or with those uh, little pieces of equipment. Um, but um, yeah, we might not know the sort of the social and um, and cultural meaning that this object used to have, and we might not know how they used to play it and what were the rules exactly. To come closer to our age, uh, date and age, to our day and age, sorry about that, um, we also talk about things that are no longer playable in our videoludic heritage, in our videoludic tradition, because some of the hardware and software that we used to use when we played in the 70s and the beginning of the 80s, uh, is quickly um, degraded and lost and broken. And so many of the things that we write about when we write about the history of games in that period is actually uh, at danger of being no longer playable or already no longer playable. And there's something going on. There's an ambulance passing by here. I hope it's not too um, disrupting. Okay. Maybe given the fact that I'm talking to mostly to undergrad people here, um, you might be more familiar with the fact that with the uh, with Microsoft stopping supporting Flash as a platform for gaming and applications, we also lost a considerable part of our gaming heritage uh, in the past years. So there are things that we study and talk about that we can no longer access or that we cannot understand as a plaything. Among those, there's also abandonware, for example, the abandoned game, uh, the abandoned worlds of uh, multi multiplayer massive online role playing games, for example. They still exist as artifacts, but can no longer be played because they're no longer frequented by players. So we cannot have the kind of social and playful activities that these games were designed for. There's also a category of games that we call the ephemeral games that can only be played during game events or maybe only once because the games in a way record your IP as a player and uh, do not allow you to log in twice. So you really only have one chance like presumably in actual biological life. Another example of things that are minimally playable and almost do not require players to be called games are clicker games or idle games or, well, games of this kind that you probably know, grow games or idle games, boring games, number of different names in the games community. Anyway, I mean, games that only require um, a setup or an agreement for the player, and then they could continue undisturbed without player interaction. Another example would be also games played by bots or ga games played by AIs. What you see on screen right now is a screenshot taken by Deercam, which is an art installation by Brent Watanabe, who used the game engine of Grand Theft Auto V and put a camera behind a deer and left the game running for weeks, seeing this deer roaming around the city and getting in all sorts of trouble. We could call this a game, uh, but definitely it doesn't have a traditional kind of player, right? It's a game played by an AI. So as I mentioned, we talk about these things as well. So unplayable games or minimally playable games, but they're not the focus of game studies. 
one paper that maybe I could mention that might be interesting to you as uh, philosophy students is the fact is called Zero Player Games by two quite well-known figures in our field called Stefan Bjork and Jasper Jewell. Uh, it was presented at a Philosophy of Computer Games conference in 2012. And theirs is one of the pioneering forays into games that we cannot quite play or that do not require players. In their paper, they divided these groups of this particular category of games, so to speak, into four categories. The first three set up only games, games played by AIs and solved games, actually feature games that one could potentially play or one did play or game that we could go back to playing in some, some ways. However, the fourth one, hypothetical games, is the only item in their category that is truly unplayable. The games listed in hypothetical games, according to uh, Björk and you, are imaginations. They are games that we only imagine to solve a certain situation or to examine a certain question or the possibility for a game to actually be played, but never existed as a physical artifact, never existed as a plaything. So out of the four categories here, hypothetical games is the only one that is effectively and always was unplayable because they only exist as speculations or as some would say, as fictions. In there being fiction, maybe, and you as philosophy students might be making this connection, one could think of hypothetical games as something similar to maybe thought experiments or fictional cases, which are effectively tools used in philosophy to reason a situation out and so on. So this talk emerges from my interest uh, in talking about fictional games as a philosophical exercise to explore and discuss games that, technically speaking, do not exist and were never playable. I think it's a fascinating, although perhaps a bit niche, use of philosophy for game studies and literature. As I mentioned, there was some initial uh, attempt, there was an initial attempt by Björk and Yule to uh, look into imaginary games and games that only exist in fiction. And a bit later, actually one year earlier, um, a book by my friend and philosopher, Chris Bateman, called Imaginary Games, that in a way tackles a similar subject, but never quite looks into fictional and hypothetical games because he uses imagination, or rather he studies imagination in its role within actual play. So how we as real players use imagination in actual uh, acts of play. So if nobody wanted to talk very much about hypothetical games and fictional games, as I mentioned, Björk and Yule just wrote three lines in one paper, um, other two white bearded males decided to do um, the honors and maybe write an entire book about it, as I said, uh, which is coming out in December. So in the next part, in the second half of the presentation, I will tell you about fictional games, what they are and what their use is. So fictional games, let's get started after about, I don't know, probably already 15 minutes. Um, what are fictional games? In the book, we define fictional games as playful activities and ludic artifacts that are conceptualized by the authors as part of their fictional worlds. I hope you can understand what I mean here, but in case it's a bit hard, because of course it's a definition and it's coming a bit out of nothing, um, I, presented, I present to you two uh, examples. In case you're a Star Wars fan, you might remember this scene in episode four, in which a game is played called Holo Chess on the, or Dejaric, which is played on a round board with holographic pieces of aliens, weird aliens, fighting off in a way that resembles chess, right? Another clear example of a fictional game, in this case, a fictional sport could be Quidditch, as it appears in the fictional world of Harry Potter. I hope those examples clarify what I'm talking about, right? They, they need to be games that are just unique to that fictional world, that cannot be played, and that in a way um, are conceptualized only as part of fictional worlds. So in the book, we examine expressive and philosophical uses of games that exist within larger works of fiction. 
games that are typically incomplete in their representation and are sketched out just barely enough for us to understand as fiction uh, audience, as fiction recipients, their functioning. We treat fictional games as creations that need to trigger the imagination of the appreciator of a work of fiction. And they're not meant to be actually played, or at least originally they were not meant to be played. So when I presented this idea to my students using the same two examples that I presented in the previous slide, so Dejarik and Quidditch, they said, well, you know, this is not, th those are not very good examples. And I scratched my head for a little while and then understand what they meant. What they meant is that those games actually exist as playable playthings, as artifacts, or as mode of, modes of knowledge like a sport and Again, this seems a bit strange, but I'm going to argue that what we see in front of us here are not fictional games. They are games that were reverse engineered, completed and adapted for them to be actually playable. We can buy Dejarik in like Disney stores and um, uh, entertainment centers and, and we can play um, uh, Quidditch, although this version called Muggle Quidditch, so Quidditch for the people who do not have um, the possibility to use magic, is a bona fide sport with charts and rules and boards and a whole sports structure. However, what I'm claiming is that these two are different artifacts that were inspired by fictional games than the fictional games that originated them. They needed to be completed and redesigned in, to some extent because they offer different cultural functions than fictional games, namely that of being playable by human beings with human capabilities. I hope you see what I mean here, in case the idea of why these are not fictional games anymore, but the ones in the novel and the movies are, I presented another example. And here it comes. In case you like video games, and I suppose you're of that age, uh, you might have played a, um, video game RPG from a Polish team called CD Projekt Red, and the game is called The Witcher. In the first Witcher, um, the, the protagonist encounters a game called Gwent being played by NPC, non-playing characters. The game cannot be played by the protagonist, so the player cannot effectively play the game, but it serves a, in a way like a background function. It makes the fictional world of the game feel richer with lore, tradition, and activities that go beyond the mere appearance of the hero in a village, you know what I mean. So Gwent is sort of like a world-building tool as a fictional game that cannot be played, and it's incompletely presented to the, to the player of the main game, The Witcher. So in this case, it is absolutely a fictional game. It is incomplete and unplayable. One of the follow-ups one of the sequels of The Witcher, namely The Witcher 3, Wild Hunt, has a version of Gwent, but in this case, Gwent is a playable thing, meaning that the player, if they want, can enjoy and engage a game or multiple games of Gwent. Technically speaking, in game studies, we would call Gwent right now not a fictional game, but a nested game or a mini game. So a game that is that exists and it's playable within a larger game frame, so to speak. Uh, the same team then published Gwent in 2018 as a standalone card game because Gwent is play, played uh, with cards. And in this case, like, obviously, it's an actually existing game presented as a game and playable as a game, so it's obviously not a fictional game. I hope this example clarifies what I mean and what belongs and doesn't belong according to our framework in the category fictional games. Where do we encounter fictional games in a variety of um, fiction forms, um, animated series like The Simpsons, where Bart is doting over his copy of Bone Storm, a fighting game with brutal and gory violence. Or in case you like TV series in Park and Rec Parks and Recreation, um, in one particular episode called The Cones of Dunshire, some of the characters play a game called Cones of Dunshire, which is labyrinthine and super complicated in its rule in its rules and behaviors and so on and so forth, which is so for comedic purposes. 
So they, they cannot only have a background function, a world building functions, fictional games, but they can also have an absurd comedic um, slant to it, to them. Take this example. This is a fictional game within a game, namely um, in Mass Effect 3. The game is called Kepesh Yakshi, and it's played by two characters that come from different parts of the galaxy of a general galactic civilization. They are playing a game, but the player, for example, me playing this game, cannot actually partake in the game that they're playing. The player controls a dialogue between the two characters and the way in which they play the game in a way mirrors that dialogue. It mirrors the situation and the relation between the two characters. The game does more than just mirroring the dialogue, though. It also lets us know that in this pan-human civilization or multi-human civilization, they still play games for leisure. And the kind of games that they play might tell us something about their culture. For example, the culture in which this game takes place must be uh, technologically advanced because it's with holograms and spaceships, right? Um, and the culture in which this game is played might also have something in common with ours because this is clearly like an adaptation of chess. So chances are that even in this culture, hierarchy matters, territorial domination matters, the optimization of resources and performance are considered to be good things to do within a playable environment. So what the game is trying to say here is that human values at a very basic level that at least in the way we experience them right now in which performance winning uh, territorial domination and so on and so forth are concerned are still holding and we can get all of that just by looking at how the game works and what the game looks like i think it's a pretty clever way of doing world building right Take this other example. This is from a uh, James Bond movie called uh, Never Say Never Again uh, from 1983. And what we're looking at is a scene in which James Bond is playing a game against a Romanian philanthropist and game designer, Maximilian Largo. Imagine that this is 1983, so the fact that this is a 3D game was in a way, I wouldn't say prescient because we had some, some games looking like this kind of but definitely like projecting towards a certain future. How is this game interesting? Well, um, I would say that this game has an interesting function in terms of indirect characterization. This is what they would call it in literary studies. What I mean to say is that, <coughs> I'm sorry, the game allows or functions as a context in which the players reveal aspects of their character that would not otherwise be visible in a normal situation. Or maybe, uh, like in this case, a character like Maximilian Largo on screen right now is introduced exactly in an act of play. So Largo challenges um, James Bond at this game of domination, which is the name of the game he designed, and starts by beating him, mostly because he was not explaining all of the rules to James Bond, especially a rule that would say, like, if you make mistakes and eventually lose the game, you will be electrocuted through the handles by which you control the game. So you understand that this already projects Maximilian Largo as a person who's sly, unreliable, tries to get an advantage over others, and so on and so forth. Whereas it pictures in the same scene, James Bond as somebody who learns at superhuman speed, is capable of great strategical thinking and has a superhuman resistance to pain. In fact, most of the people in this scene are very worried about his safety, but he manages to go through almost little, uh, little um, a dosage of electric current. So do you understand what I mean? Hopefully in terms of uh, indirect characterization, a game in a way sets up a context in which we, some traits of the protagonist of a narrative are revealed or refined. Similarly, in uh, Dragon Age or um, Inquisition, uh, 2014 games, there's a poker-inspired fictional games that help us reveal some of the traits of the characters that are in play. Obviously, this is a role-playing game. All the fictional games that I discussed until now have this kind of background function. 
They function either as world building elements of, or for indirect characterization, as I mentioned. So in other words, are not necessarily the center of attention, but in a way complete a fictional picture or enrich a fictional picture. There are, however, games that have a more central function within a fictional narrative. Um, they have a central role and they become sort of, of primary importance, almost like a character within the narrative. I have a few examples of that, of games which are fictional and that are so central to a narrative, a movie or a script, or particularly poignant to a narrative that they become almost like the crux of the narration. So take, for example, The Running Man, um, which is a movie taken from a Stephen King book that came out in uh, 1987 with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, in this movie, the protagonist is in a way forced to play a lethal game in a maze or rather like a closed environment, then it's completely televised. So the public can decide more or less what happens to him and he needs to survive um, very cruel and potentially deadly situations. Similarly, you might already be thinking the Hunger Games has a big game as a central context of the narration, almost the character itself. Similarly, we could talk about Squid Game in that sense, or of Ender's Game, in case you read, you read the 1984 novel by um, Orson Scott Card. You might also notice, and that's kind of interesting, that when a game is central, sort of to the narrative, it also appears in the title, or tends to appear in the title of the work in question, Hunger Games, Squid Game, Ender's Game. Another interesting thing, uh, Games like Ender's Game or many of the ones that I talked about as having a background function are games that are unplayable for very practical reason, which is either they are fictionally incomplete, so we are not given enough information to fully understand its functioning, or they require advanced technologies or magic. So those are games that cannot be played for functional reasons, so to speak. Whereas the first, the last three that I talked about, so The Running Man, The Hunger Games and Squid Game, are to a degree unplayable in our society because it clashes against these sort of moral standards and moral obligations that we tend to abide to as good citizens as, as, and good people. Many of these kind of games involve torture and more murder. If you're interested in the book, we talk about the different kinds of incompleteness, but this is not necessarily super important. So what might be interesting to you is that the book that we wrote about fictional games focuses on a dozen of themes, many of which have a philosophical interest or build on philosophical uh, ground. So among the chapters, um, we talk about background and focal uh, fictional games, unplayability and the comedic potential of games, and then the most more philosophical themes come into play such as the ideological use of a fictional game within a fictional world. So the way in which power might impose a certain kind of playful activity on its subjects, or maybe the ways in which fictional games depicted within a fictional world also in a way mirror and represent the values and the aspirations of that culture. There's a whole chapter about the opposite idea. So how fictional games can function not as something that echo or reaffirm the values that are um, imposed by institutional power, but rather function as subversive, subversive elements or forces that change the minds of people or make them realize that there's an alternative to the current situation and the current relationship with power. We use and talk about fictional games as deceptive devices. In many cases in narratives, those games, think of Black Mirror, for example, are used to sort of blur the boundaries between what is real and what is virtual, or what is play and what is non-play or serious life. Uh, we have a chapter on fictional games as tools for human transcendence in which we bring in philosophy of religion and propose reflections on human evolution through the use of fictional games. There are a few actual narratives and fictions in which fictional games are used to propel human evolution or human transcendence in particular ways. In case you read uh, Hermann S's, uh, the 
um, what is the name, the, the Beads game, or for example, Alistair Reynolds' uh, Diamond Dogs, you might know what I'm talking about. And finally, there's the last chapters in which fictional games are treated as opportunities for meta-reflection, so meta-referentiality and satire. So as a way to laugh about game culture, game development and game studies. The book contains 93 fictional games. So if you're probably thinking, oh, maybe they didn't think about that one, chances are that we did. And we actually had a few more, like about seven or eight more that were easily possible to be put into the book, but the editors were already on our case and the book was getting already too big, so it, we capped it at 93. Now, since I have a few more minutes, and this is a philosophy conference, again, I'm very happy to be here, I would like to take a little time to talk about maybe one topic, right, that might be interesting from a philosophical point of view. So the idea that literature and fiction can say something about our culture and criticize our culture. So the idea that we can use fictional games as meta-referential tools and satirical tools. So very quickly, in conclusion, I'm gonna show you something. Fictional games, I argue, we argue, can present a critique or a future projection of the dystopian kind of how actual games are made, played, used and shared socially. One quick way to think about this would be to think about the uh, virtual world in Ready Player One. You might not know, but it origi or originally originated as, <laughs> originally originated, easy, easy for me to say. It started off as a, as a video game, like a massively shared video game. And then it became like a world which offered services and social activities that went beyond games. Um, what it tells us about, about our society in the way that Ernest Klein projects it is that the kind of socioeconomic hierarchies that we have in our world will be somehow also reflected in the virtual one and also will shine like a pretty dystopian and warring light about what is the cultural and political power of the corporations who own the worlds that we presumably will spend more and more time in in the future as uh, workers, as members of our society, as citizens. Do you know what I'm saying? So it projects, it uses like a very criticable uh, fictional games as a way to criticize the way in which we're moving with games, simulations, and social media. I already mentioned uh, an episode of 1995, episode of uh, The Simpsons, in which a few fictional games are presented. In this case, Bone Storm is shown on the picture. Uh, and Bonestorm is kind of funny because in multiple instances during the episode, it's used to criticize games, right? Or rather the stupid sophomoric and brutal violence of some fighting games in the 90s, especially, of course, Mortal Kombat 2 and 3, right? But uh, the same episode also presents like a simulation game. This is Lee Carvalho's Putin Challenge, and it's a golf simulation which is a satire of that genre of games back at the time because it exaggerates features such as their fastidious and overly technical gameplay, uh, their aesthetical blandness and the patronizing ways in which the game sets up a relationship with the player. So you could see that the, in a way The Simpsons in a way burnt both end of um, the games industry in the 90s when they were airing this particular episode. <clears throat> in case you're players of games and gamers, uh, this is a particularly maybe interesting and recent game that you might have played yourself. It's called Disco Elysium, published and developed by a British company called za um, Why is this interesting? Well, to begin with, uh, Disco Elysium features a wide and great variety of fictional games. Most of them are board games. But one of them is a radio operated video game of sorts called Viral Untethered. We get to know about this fictional game Viral Untethered by visiting the game studio of the company that produced it called uh, Fortress Accident and by talking to former employees of the company. Um, through these kind of investigations is a sort of police kind of an investigation kind of game, we discover, and I quote from my book, 
that the game was overly ambitious in its mechanical complexity and narrative intricacy. The game Viral and Tethered put the mental health of the game developers to the test for years and eventually forced the game company to discontinue its development and to declare bankruptcy. It doesn't take much imagination, this is still a quote from the book, to recognize a definite meta-referential intent in Zaums, the developers of Disco Elysium, decision to present the story of a small-scale um, development team biting off more than they could chew in working to produce a large title. So this was very like a, a, a fictional game, which is also self-burn, right, for taking so long and spending so much money and um, wasting so much psych um, psychological energy and health, maybe, in the production of something of the sort. A last and perhaps also interesting example is a TV series called Mythic Quest, uh, Raven's Banquet, which is out for Apple Plus, I believe, in which, well, the series is about a development studio working on a fictional game that does not exist called Mythic Quest. And uh, the development studio and the game are both used as context to criticize contemporary games culture and contemporary games development tackling themes that are like quite popular in um, and quite um, perhaps even troublesome that relate to games culture, for example, like, like crunch culture and blatant sexism, um, injustice on the workplace, um, sophomoric use of violence and um, well, a number of problems not, not last the uh, relatively recent Gamergate uh, discussion. So again, this game studio and the game and discussions concerning the game and sessions within the game serve a critical and satirical purpose towards how games are made, understood, developed, uh, talked about in the media. Should you be interested in looking into how satire can be mediated by play and games, we also have a paper about that one. Uh, and you can read it for free if you check out my website, should you be interested in the use of satire, the use of playfulness and play as a channel towards satire. So in conclusion, I hope I showed you that maybe your background in philosophy can be used in ways that are also interesting and not strictly speaking philosophical, but in a way that are still relevant to your background. In my case here, I'm using my philosophical background to look at games. Normally it was regular games, but now it's also games that do not exist. And on the flip side, also game studies can, in a way, make better friends with philosophy branches such as philosophy of fiction or speculative philosophy, for example, the ones that take care and study uh, fictional cases and thought experiments in order to help us understand these phenomena better. So should you be interested in more about these themes and maybe how philosophical and how expressive fictional games are, the book will be out in December. And once again, I thank you for having me. It's very fun to talk to young students and hopefully this was uh, interesting and engaging enough to not put you to sleep. So uh, if you have any questions or are you curious about my job or what I do as a philosopher, you just feel free to ask.